Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our daily devotion for Tuesday, August 25th, 2020. I pray that our time together in God's word today is a blessing to all of us as together we grow in our faith and in our knowledge of Jesus Christ as our Savior. We begin today with a reading from Psalm 32. How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is a person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in summer's heat. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is faithful pray to you immediately. When great floodwaters come, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with joyful shouts of deliverance. Solomon has now completed the construction of the Lord's temple. And in our reading for today from 1 Kings chapters 7 and 8, we will hear about Solomon's dedication of the temple. So all the work King Solomon did in the Lord's temple was completed. Then Solomon brought in the consecrated things of his father David, the silver, the gold, and the utensils, and put them in the treasuries of the Lord's temple. At that time, Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, all the tribal heads and the ancestral leaders of the Israelites before him at Jerusalem, in order to bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from the city of David, that is, Zion. So all the men of Israel were assembled in the presence of King Solomon in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month at the festival. All the elders of Israel came, and the priests picked up the Ark. The priests and the Levites brought the Ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and the holy utensils that were in the tent. King Solomon and the entire congregation of Israel, who had gathered around him and were with him in front of the ark, were sacrificing sheep, goats, and cattle that could not be counted or numbered, because there were so many. The priests brought the ark of the Lord's covenant to its place, into the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place beneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim were spreading their wings over the place of the ark, so that the cherubim covered the ark and its poles from above. The poles were so long that their ends were seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they were not seen from outside the sanctuary. They are still there today. Nothing was in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites when they came out of the land of Egypt. When the priests came out of the holy place, the cloud filled the Lord's temple, and because of the cloud, the priests were not able to continue ministering, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Then Solomon said, The Lord said that he would dwell in total darkness. I have indeed built an exalted temple for you, a place for your dwelling forever. The king turned around and blessed the entire congregation of Israel while they were standing. He said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He spoke directly to my father David, and he has fulfilled the promise by his power. He said, Since the day I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I have not chosen a city to build a temple in among any of the tribes of Israel, so that my name would be there. But I have chosen David to rule my people Israel. My father David had his heart set on building a temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, since your heart was set on building a temple for my name, you have done well to have this desire. Yet you are not the one to build it. Instead, your son, your own offspring, will build it for my name. The Lord has fulfilled what he promised. I have taken the place of my father David, and I sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. I have built the temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. I have provided a place there for the ark where the Lord's covenant is that he made with our ancestors when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. 
As we continue to read in Paul's letters, Paul's second letter to the Christians in Corinth, Paul talks about his ministry and how his ministry is different than Moses' ministry was, since he is a minister of a new covenant. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are Christ's letter, delivered by us, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence we have through Christ before God. It is not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. He has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, chiseled in letters on stones, came with glory, so that the Israelites were not able to gaze steadily at Moses' face because of its glory, which was set aside, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation had glory, the ministry that brings righteousness overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was set aside was glorious, what endures will be even more glorious. Since then, we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory of what was being set aside, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the veil remains. It is not lifted, because it is set aside only in Christ. Yet still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all, with unfailed, unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In our reading from the Solid Declaration of the Formula of Concord today, we hear about those two chief teachings of Scripture, the Law and the Gospel. These two doctrines, we believe and confess, should always be diligently taught in God's Church forever, even to the end of the world. They must be taught with the proper distinction of which we have heard. Through the preaching of the Law and its threats in the ministry of the New Testament, the hearts of impenitent people may be terrified and they may be brought to a knowledge of their sins and to repentance. This must not, not be done in such a way that they lose heart and despair in this process. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. So the law points and leads us not from Christ, but to Christ, who is the end of the law. People must be comforted and strengthened again by the preaching of the Holy Gospel about Christ our Lord. In other words, to those who believe the gospel, God forgives all their sins through Christ, adopts them as children for his sake, and out of pure grace, without any merit on their part, justifies and saves them. However, he does not do this in such a way that they may abuse God's grace and may sin hoping for grace. Paul thoroughly and forcefully shows this in the distinction between the law and the gospel. Our hymn for today is a stanza from the hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. And we pray. O oh God, you resist the proud and give grace to the humble. Grant us true humility after the likeness of your only Son, that we may never be arrogant and prideful, and thus provoke your wrath, but in all lowliness be made partakers of the gifts of your grace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you again for spending this time in God's word with me today. God richly bless your day, and I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.